that's beautiful. Appreciate that so much. Welcome to the gospel. Find your places, your seats, and whatever you like. Them back chairs are high premium. Those chairs in the back, they're high premium there. When I bought those chairs in the back, those black chairs in the back are so comfortable. Really, they are. They were $55 a piece. I looked them up the other night. Now they're $110 a piece now, over double in price. Unbelievable how things have gone up. Amen. You know, when she started playing some of those songs, those familiar songs that uh, Sandy Atzo plays there, it's like, it's like your mother touching your cheek and telling you she loves you. You know, those old gospel songs, when you've been raised up in the things of the faith, those are, those are soothing to the soul. And they just give peace to you. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. So happy Mother's Day. I hope you called. I called my mom, but she wasn't home. Mom and dad have been gone for a while. And, but for you that have your moms here, I'd highly recommend you give them a call one way or another. But we're going to sing a little happy birthday. We didn't do it last week. This dear lady right here, stand up if you would, 99-year-old lady. Ready? Hit it. Happy birthday to... No. Birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday, bless you, happy birthday to you. Ninety-nine years, and she's in good shape. She's in good shape for 99 years old. I mean, still coming to church and talking and walking and vertical, that's all big. (laughs) That is big. So let's sing a song by our number one. Come on up here, buddy. Good morning. Let's stand as we sing. This is what we're singing right here. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed in, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I believe unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith. Amen. But I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. That's good stuff right there. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your mercy and your grace that was poured out on us this week. Thank you for being good to us, Lord. You're good all the time. Thank you for the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that has been made available to us. Thank you for the privilege it is to be able to come here and to gather together as uh, like-minded believers and to uh, worship you, Lord. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth as we spend this time together. I pray for uh, power in teaching and the preaching. Lord, may you be lifted up throughout everything we do this morning, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Greet one another with, uh, as Mrs. Atto plays through one more time. <clears throat> Mr. With? What's up with you? That was a fabulous rendition of that song again by Sandy Atto, our own Sandy Atto. Yes, may I help her up them stairs, the old girl. 
Well, unfortunately, this is the last day I'm going to be able to introduce my company that's here. I've had company for about three weeks now, and I've loved every minute of it. This is my, on the front row is my nephew, Scott, and his wife, Lori, and they're from Avila Beach, California, and he's my brother Jim's son, and I'm so happy to have him here, especially today. And I just want to tell you that Sandy and whoever picked that song today, Lori looked at me and she said, that's the song they played at my baptism. And the tears came, so that was just perfect. So welcome everybody today. I said, buddy, way to help her. We appreciate the Bowers being here with us, my hero, Brother Bowers and his wife. Quit, quit, quit denying it, brother. You are a humble guy, too. Most of you understand, have you ever eaten honey out of a honeycomb? If you have, raise your hand. Come on, don't lie to me. If you haven't eaten honey out of a honeycomb, it's a little different than honey. It's, it's different. There's something special about it. It's, it's, to me, it's a little sweeter than the normal honey. I, I, they sell honey with a honeycomb in it. I, I try to always buy that. And I'm going to tell you why I do that. If you leave honey set long enough, it'll settle out. And uh, at the bottom, it'll get a little hard stuff, and I'm not sure what that is, whether it's a sugar or whether it's a wax. I'm not sure what's in it. But something settles out at the bottom goes bad. Basically, people then throw it. Oftentimes, you can, you can change that, I think, by heating it up a little bit. But nevertheless, most people, by that time, they get rid of it. But honey, you know that you don't have refrigerate. It's antibacterial. Don't have refrigerate it. If you buy it with a honeycomb in it, it'll never settle out. The chemical in the honeycomb keeps the honey from separating. How many? You probably didn't know that, did you? But if you buy honey with a honeycomb in it, you can just leave it up there for three, four years. And uh, you can take it down, and you can. it'll be just as good as the day. You, I used to have honey. I had at one time four hives at the back of my house at San Carlos Park. And uh, did the honey, separated it, gathered it, and I learned a lot about God. I just to be honest with you, learned a lot about God, and I have a whole lot more to learn about God. He is so big, so phenomenal, so amazing. Well, March second in the book that everybody ought to have at least one of these to look at it. This book, have you considered? These are 365 reasons to believe in creation. Thousands of years, the bees, the bees' honeycomb has fascinated mankind. Uh, uh, Pappus of Alexandria, a third century AD astronomer and a mathematician, was intrigued with a honeycomb shape found inside the hives. He asked himself, why is a honeycomb cell six-sided? First of all, you understand, those are little bees making all that. They make those six-sided things like perfect. And they make them over and over and over and over. You take them all out, and they'll remake the whole thing again. Why isn't the honeycomb cell a circle, triangle, or square? Uh, this man found in his, in his search in 3rd century AD that the six-sided shape, the hexagon, holds more honey and takes less wax to produce than any other shape. Not coincidental. It was not until modern calculus was invented over a thousand years later that the shape of the cap at the end of the honeycomb cell was analyzed. Each cell cap is a pyramid made of three, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, rhombuses, rhombuses maybe. Well, anyway, I don't even know what the word means. This cap shape was found to require the smallest amount of wax for construction. Now, think about that. Each bee knows how to build this type of cell and cap. Some say they are great engineers. However, it is the one who designed the programming that controls the honeybee who is really the great engineer, and that is Jesus, the maker of all things, the creator of all that is, and he that holds everything together. Just the bee ought to convince you there's a God. They, by the way, they fly out to six miles away from the hive. They collect pollen and go back to the hive 
and tell the other bees where the pollen's at through some sort of little dance they do, or they have some sort of subliminal communication that we've not, we've not discovered yet. But they tell each other. Now, if, if, if you went to an area, and you know how small a bee is, everything looks huge. Everything's big. Flower's big. And how in the world would you be able to know where you're at if you don't have a GPS? I mean, most of you that travel, GPS about saved my marriage. I don't know about you. Every time I'd travel, it was a war. My wife was a navigator. I'm supposed to be driving the vehicle, and she don't know where she's at. And I said, if you don't know where you're at, how am I supposed to know where I'm at? And I went, went from there downhill. And, uh, and you know, <laughs> I'm just confessing up. I'm just confessing up. You love it when I fail. So I got a GPS, and I was like, man, this is easy traveling. It'll tell you a mile, half mile, quarter mile, eighth mile, 900 feet, 600 feet, all of a sudden take a right, you know, and I mean, like, this is too good to be true. I had one guy say one time, I don't even need, to, need a wife now. That was big, and he was kidding. It is Mother's Day. Let's lighten up. If you don't have this book, this is not your typical man's book. Typical man's book would be a little skinny thing. Once in a while I come in front of you and I say, you just have to have this book. You just have to read this book. You just have to spend the time. You have to pay the price. You have to make yourself your lazy old self do something you don't want to do. You need to read this book. Evidence of Demands, a verdict. This book's not young. It was, it was compiled together by Josh McDowell in the 70s. I've read every page of it a couple times, go over it, back over it. I'm telling you, you need to know why you believe what you believe. It's not boring. It really is not boring. Okay, how the Bible, how'd they come up with 66 books in the Bible? Could you answer that question? Well, he does in a nice, simple, straight up and down way so you can understand it. How they came up with a canon. The word canon means rule. There were rules that were available when they made the Bible. So this goes over it. It's, it's meant to be understood by the average Christian. It's not meant for just a theologian. So I hope you can get this. This book is only $20. That's a lot of paper for 20 bucks. And hurry up and get it because the next low is going to be 40 Okay, brother, you're up. Morning, everybody. I was thinking about GPS, and all, I think most of us in here grew up without GPS, and we survived. I traveled all over this country as a kid. I left home at 18 from Connecticut down to Louisiana, and I traveled into different towns and cities. I didn't have AC, by the way, in my car. I used to take a bag of ice, and I used to sit it on my lap and open the windows, and the wind would blow through the ice, and it would be my air conditioning, and when the bag melted, I'd go get another bag, and... And our kids just have no idea how we survived. But GPS, I remember buying maps to go through cities. And I'd, you know, turn that map this way, that. And today, my sense of direction is superior compared to my kids. Because they're depending on technology to get, get them everywhere. And I agree, technology is great. I use it just as much as they do today. But I have a better sense of direction as a result of having to go through, you know, okay, well, the sun's this way. I know we have to go west right now so a lot of things like that helped us back in the day that we're going to lose it's like writing people don't write anymore they lost the art of writing because they don't write they type or now they siri so a lot of things are going to get lost over time so we're that generation that gets to testify about how it was the old the old days the good old days as they say the good old days all right let's see if i can get this thing going here all right, so um, got a lot to cover. Um, I don't know if I'll finish uh, our study on the candlestick, the golden candlestick, this morning. But if you remember last week, we got a glimpse into the golden candlestick as a foreshadowing, of course, as the light of Christ. But it also was giving us a glimpse into the local church. Because when you go to Revelation, you see the golden candlesticks appear in the midst where Christ is in the midst. 
And that, those golden candlesticks reflect the local church, the light of Christ. That's, that's who we are. We're nothing more than a called out, a, a body of believers assembled to reflect the light of Christ, not only as we gather we collectively, but also individually in our lives. And that this brings out the great truth in the New Testament that Christ is in you. Now, the hope of glory, the Bible calls this a mystery. It's a mystery because it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. Remember, that tabernacle that we're studying isn't complete because it was the, the presence of God was closed off to man. Once a year, the high priest would go in and do his thing with the blood, and then out he went. But man had no access to God in that sense. And that veil came down through the, the work of Christ on the cross. Now he has access to God. But even greater, Paul writes here, through the Holy Spirit, is Christ in you. That's a mystery. You've got to chew on that for a while. When you get down and out, you've got to remember, if you're a believer, you have Christ in you. I mean, I wish I could think about that 24 hours a day. It, it would radically change sometimes the, the way I think, the way I act, you know, some of my temper tantrums, whatever it occurs that gets me in the flesh, I've got to remember, Christ is in me. The power to live that life it, it, it's, it's mind-boggling, the fact that Christ puts up with me. <laughs> but that's a great truth because we're now the Holy of Holies, which didn't, no man had access to that except for the high priest. And so we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so this goes back to, if Christ is in us, then we are that light. And in John 12, verse 46, I come a, a light into the world that whosoever believeth in me, and I'd say most of you have, should not abide in darkness. Our lives changed the day we got saved. Now, it didn't, sometimes people change radically. They get it. They become spiritual on day one. Others take time. They go through a process of maturation, of maturing. But the, the end of the day, we see our, our life is different. Our, our worldview and our perception of the world changes, which makes it more difficult. It's easy to go with the, the flow. And it's, now we're going against the grain. We're going upriver as a Christian against the world. The world's against us. We're against the world. And yet we, that's because we don't abide in darkness, and they do. So really, we have a, a much different perspective. And uh, that creates a lot of angst in our life, but it also gives us great hope of what God has planned for us. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, Again, we're blameless, harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Isn't it interesting? I think Bible-believing Christians are probably the least, or the most nonviolent people in the world. Now, we've been accused throughout the ages, the dark ages, of being violent. Those aren't Bible believers. They were putting Bible believers to death. But the reality is we're harmless, we're blameless, we're nonviolent. That doesn't mean we don't have a voice, we don't stand up for what we believe, but in this case, blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, and what? In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Interesting, and Paul wrote, crooked and perverse nation. We think we live in a crooked and perverse nation. It's no different than it was back then. Now, we think it is because we have access to information more than they did. But it hasn't changed. It's still crooked. It's still corrupt. It's still perverse. The world doesn't change. If any man... In, Loves the world, is a friend of the world, he's an enemy of God. The world has always been opposed to God. It hasn't changed. And, and in, that, in that midst of that, we're to be shining as lights in the world. People ought to see us as different. Yeah, they sometimes think us as odd. That's actually a compliment. The Bible calls us peculiar people. We are peculiar because we go against what the world believes. We ought to be thankful for that. It's a testimony. You are the light of the world. The city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. God cares about our testimony. He's a great deal of concern about how we act and how we think before others. And I always think, when I think about testimony, I think of Lot. Now, Lot had a terrible testimony. Man, he looked at the well-watered plains of Sodom and eventually ended up there as some town councilman or mayor or whatever he was and but the bible says that he vexed his righteous soul from day to day like he knew what was right but he didn't do what was right 
And when it was time to get out and flee Sodom, when the warning came, he went to all his family and they mocked him because he'd lost his testimony, his ability to influence for good because he had a poor testimony. Now, in all fairness, it's easy to, to jump on Lot. But let's remind ourselves, Sodom had no Bible. As we live in a time where sodomy is, is popular. It's promoted. They're given greater rights than, than normal people. This is a, and yet we have a Bible, we have church, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about what's happening in our nation. But back then, granted, he had poor testimony, but he had no Bible, he had no local church, he had no indwelling Holy Spirit. I mean, think about that. What we have, and yet a lot of Christians today, hard to believe when they do, when they do um, surveys, Christians themselves are for abortion. So, I would imagine the judgment will be much greater with the light we have. So, we, God does care about our testimony. And so, but we know, as we talked last week, sometimes we get ourselves in a bind Spiritually, we get, we get a little stale, we get a little dry, we get a little uh, cold, um, we backslide, and it's important to understand that that light can get dull and dim, and that's the time to get plugged back in. And I thought of some things to help us to get plugged back in, because this happens to just about every Christian I've met. They get a little, they start struggling, and then they find themselves drawing further away from God instead of closer, and there's things that... I always remind myself to do when I start to feel that way or I'm starting to act that way. Get back into the Bible reading and meditation. It goes, don't you find it a struggle to read the scripture sometimes? Like you wake up, oh, I gotta read. Like that, that it should be like, man, oh Lord, I can't wait to read. But we get like, oh Lord, I gotta read, you know? And then meditate on it. It's even harder, more difficult, more challenging. But why is that? Because it opposes the flesh. And so Bible reading and meditation, and Joshua 1 is, you know, meditate on that word day and night. Don't turn from the left, don't turn to the right. Chew on it like the honeycomb. Because the Bible, by the way, likens Scripture to the honeycomb. Sweet going in, but sometimes when you apply it, it gets bitter. Prayer. We have to, God calls us to be in an attitude of prayer all the time. Use your, you know, redeeming the time for the, for the days are evil. And using prayer as a, a way to really draw close. We're going to spend a lot of time on prayer, by the way, here in the upcoming sessions where we talk about the golden altar as a, as a as representative of prayer. The local church is, you know, COVID did a lot of damage to the local church. It got people thinking it's okay to stay home and do online. And online serves a purpose, and there's a lot of good to it, especially uh, when you talk about reaching the world and giving, getting the gospel out and teaching people. That, and there's people who can't make it to church. I get it. But online was never replaced the local church. The church means a called out assembly. Assembly. And so the local church is forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. It's important for a Man, you want to see someone get out of the will of God, get out of church. When people start telling me that uh, online's good enough for me, I, I always, man, you're not going to survive. You're going to start walking in the, not in the spirit, but in the flesh. You need to be under the influence of the Word of God and God's people. And accountability of that, and the testimony of that, all that has an influence on our lives. And that's how we stay plugged in. Outside of that, we get dull and dim. Fellowship, of course, loving the brethren and the sisters and Serving, the Bible always says, you know, this is where we learn to serve. Now, we serve outside of church, but we serve here. We serve each other. When someone's down and out, someone's celebrating. We serve because we're to esteem others better than yourselves. Can you imagine that principle in the world? If they took on that principle? Everybody's out for themselves. They're fighting for the, to get to the number one spot, to be first, to have the most money, to have the most material things. And yet, the Christian thinks the opposite. I'm about to give things away. I'm about to serve others. What a, what a principle that God calls us as part of our light is serving, esteeming others, and then, of course, giving. I think it's more blessed to give than receive. I always think of that, little, that song, the, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what we ought to be doing. And when it starts getting dull, we got to get back. We've got we to do a checkup. 
Everybody here does a checkup. Hopefully you're doing a checkup. Some people resist the doctor, don't want to go, don't think it's worthwhile. But I think every, we ought to be doing a checkup. Are these things present in our life and are they important to our life? And if not, then maybe it's time to reverse course. With that thought, talk about creation. I mean, Pastor was talking about, you know, he learned a lot studying the bee and the honeycomb. And creation is amazing when you really sit back and you start studying it. You can learn so much about God, and God teaches us a great deal about himself through creation. He speaks of that. And here's an example. When we're talking about the light again, we reflect the light of Christ. Well, the Bible calls Jesus Christ in Malachi 4 to the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness. Now, we've touched on this before. And so he was given that title so I can learn something about Jesus Christ by studying the Son. Now, I'm not going to go into all that, but I can read in Song of Solomon. This is a little deeper for the Bible students. This, is, this chapter, this verse here is reference to the church, the bride of Christ. And there's a reference here. It says, who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon? So it's calling the church like a moon. Learn about the moon and you'll learn about the church or yourself. And it's clear as the sun and terrible where did this come from? As an army with banners. Well, that's a reference to the second advent, the return of God's people after the marriage supper, returning with Christ, who is the head of the, of, of, of the church. As he comes back, the Bible refers to us as an army. The armies followed him on white horses. So again, a reference to the bride, the church, but remember, it's referring to as a, as a moon. So I can learn, if I study the sun, I study the moon, us, where do we get our light now? From the sun. So again, a reference from creation. As I look up into the heavens now, I can learn more about, about Scripture and about God. So next time you look at the moon, think about that's a reference to you, the local, or yourself as an individual, a believer, and you're reflecting the light of Christ, the sun of righteousness. Beautiful, beautiful truths in the scripture. And by the way, you spent, look at that moon. It's got a lot of dark spots on it. You get a full moon, you still got, wow, that's, a, that's a reminder of where we came from. The scars of sin. The dark, Jesus was the lamb without spot. We had spots which were sin. Continuing on this theme. That Christ is our light is, he said to his disciples there, clearly you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. So spiritually we have no power. So the church can never forget where its power comes from. And often churches do. We see as we study history, uh, we'll see churches that were once vibrant, uh, were had a revival, were vibrant, and the power of God rested on them, and are now nothing but a church building. With no power. There may be people still gathering, but there's no power. And we, all, we learned that they've somehow gotten rid of their light. And we've seen the warnings in Revelation. Remember he said, I'm going to remove, I'm going to remove the candlestick from you. That was to remove the light source, the power to do God's will. So when the movement of God evolves into the movement of man, which typically happens, there's always a degrading the power of God is removed, leaving nothing more than a machine, a facade of a church, but no power in it, not reflecting the light of Christ. This is why churches today can teach things that are so contrary to Scripture. You, you know, whether they're Methodist or they're Presbyterian or Catholic, whatever, you, you listen to some of the things they're teaching. Um, accepting homosexuality is, is a clear example of violating Scripture, but how did they get to the point where that became the norm for the church? And the body of believers, supposedly, they're calling themselves a body of believers, got to that place because the power of God left, there's no light, and then they became nothing more than a machine. I know thy works, Jesus said, thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So they have nothing more than just a building and no power. We... Now, we can apply that very truth to our lives as individuals. We can get to the point where we're, not, we're taking God for granted, like I talked about last week, and we lose the power of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about, 
more about that soon and where that power comes from. But, and we can do that, and that's time we'll get on our knees and humble ourselves and repent. We don't want to have a name that we're like living, but we're dead. Continuing with this theme about creation and itself, how it teaches us in Genesis 15, I love this. Um, he brought him forth abroad, Abram, and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Now, tell the stars is just an old English term for um, you get a bank teller, count, one who counts money, teller. So count the stars. Look now toward heaven and count the stars. If thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now, that's a reference to the believers of like faith. Remember, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So those people in the New Testament, forward, when they believe in Christ, they receive the righteousness. Well, he likens them to the stars. How interesting. Why? Because they reflect the light. That's who we are. That's what we do. And it's interesting, he describes the children of faith to those stars. Now, I don't know how many have seen something like that. If you've traveled across the country or you've been up in the mountains where there's not a lot of light, you can see that kind of picture, just like that. Now, I've got a place not too far in Colorado from where we go called Walcott, Colorado. It's pretty much central Colorado, and they've picked this place called Collective Retreats, and they have these tents out there, and it's more like glamping. These are five-star tents. These are like, I mean, Ritz-Carlton, I mean, th these tents are on steroids. They are beautiful, I mean, but this is still outdoors. You still got, you know, all the roughness of the outdoors, but you're living in, you know, a five-star little room out there in the middle of nowhere. But this Walcott, this collective retreats, is spectacular to see stars. They've placed this this, this particular retreat in a location where there's almost no light anywhere around 20, 25 miles. No light, zero. Other than the fire that they're running, you know, the, um, a little fire that they run. But there's just no lights, except for in the tents. So when you look up, like I was there about two years ago, I've seen some stars, and I've seen the sky full of stars, but I've never seen anything like this in my life. And I was coming back from the, you know, the, the, the bonfire, and as I was walking back to the tent, I looked up, and I can tell you, every square inch of the sky had a star in it. I mean, clusters. You could see, I mean, it, it was ten times more than that. And I thought, wait a minute. I've never in my life, you look up, you'll see, you know, star here, star there. You know, you'll, you'll see stars, and the further you get from the, from the light of the city, the more stars you see. But in this place... I'm telling you, there are more stars. I, I was blown away by the number of stars that I could see. And Eileen were just marveling. When, and then I thought back in Genesis 15, 5. Hey, Abram, tell the stars. Count the stars. He looked up. He said, that's impossible. There's so many. And God says, so shall thy seed be. The children of faith. Don't underestimate how many people God will save in this, in this life. I know we all thought, well, the narrow is the road. You know, very few people get saved. I, I understand that principle, but I think God's saving a lot of people. A lot of people that will be surprised he saved. They said there's some 300, possibly 300 million Chinese that have believed. I've heard that. Some people can testify to that. I just think God's... God is in the business of saving, He'll, and I think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven because he told us, if you can count the stars, then you can count the number of children. And you look up like I did in Walcott, and I said, man, alive, I've never seen so many stars in my life. Now, if you travel out west, you've got to stop either in Montana or Wyoming, somewhere where there's no light fusion, and you could see, or interference, and you'll see stars like you've never seen before. So there must be darkness in order for the stars to shine. He said, why would God allow that? So you could shine. Darkness, as evil as it is, God allows it so that he can be represented. Because the darker the night, the greater the star. The brightness of the star. 
Again, I've never seen any stars like that in my life until I got to where it was darker. So we say dark times are, are coming our way. Well, that means there's more light for us to shine. We have to think of it differently. Instead, we, we want to cower into a hole and hide as if some, God says, no, that's when the light really shines. Now, there's something for you to chew on. The darker the night, the brighter the stars shine. You just got to chew on that for a while. The darker the night, you say, man, we live in dark times. I, now, hold on now. I know our government's corrupt. And I know the woke community is just out of control. I mean, I see it everywhere I go now. I see transgenderism. I, it's just, it, but it's such a small piece of what, but they're making it like it's a big piece. And, and, but, but that corruption grieves us, and it, it angers us sometimes. But God said, that's the world. That's how it's always going to be. It's going to be dark. Your job is to shine in the midst of that darkness. Now, we can say it's dark. And politically, we are dark. And in so many ways, spiritually, we're dark. But we're not even close to what real darkness is. You want real darkness? Go to Russia. Go to China. You can't even get in as a missionary right now. I have missionary friends that have been kicked out, arrested. I've heard their testimony. China does not put up with us gathering as believers. If you gather as a believer in China, you are putting your life on the line. Now that's darkness. We're gathered here. We drove nice cars. We had a good meal, hopefully, or we'll have a good meal this afternoon. We're, we're dressed nice. We're not in darkness like we think we are. We have the freedom to worship. Ukraine doesn't have that right now. You can't go to India and get that right now. You're gonna, you go to India as a missionary, your life is on the line. That's darkness. Now if America gets to that point where we're persecuted and, and we can't worship, then we can claim it's dark times. Until then, mm -mm, just because it's corrupt, that's just the world. And God says, shine, brother, shine. Because the darker it gets, the brighter the shine. Now I'm going to teach a truth from this in the scriptures that testifies to this. Because the darkest hour in history will bring forth a far harvest unlike any time in history. Now I know Pastor talked about Nineveh as probably the greatest revival recorded in history. Quite, that's true. This is the greatest revival in history. Right here. But it's future. It's not looking back. And we'll talk about it. It's in the darkest hour of God's timetable. And yet God will do a work like no other time in history. It's called the Great Tribulation. In Revelation 7-9, after this I beheld in lo a great multitude, which no man could number. That's how big it is. A sweeping of people who are known as the tribulation saints trusting Christ. This is not church age saints. These are tribulation saints. Of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues stood before the throne for the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. There's are saved, uh, blood-bought believers at a time referring to as the great tribulation. And one of the elders answers saying, now this is, hey, he should know who these are because he's a like believer coming out of the church age. What are these that are arrayed in white robes? Who are these people? He said, sir, thou knowest. He said, these are they which came out of, and the key to it is great tribulation. The last three and a half years of a God's timetable of seven years, Daniel's 70th week, that three and a half year period will be the darkest period in man's history. The wrath of God will be unleashed like no other time in history of man. I mean, God is going to pour it out with great wrath and vengeance. And yet in that time, the Bible says, a number which no man could number. Hmm. A harvest like none ever seen before. And Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of this world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Clearly, that is the darkest period in history. No one can claim it except for these folks in the future in that three and a half years. And yet we know that God is going to do a great work. So why is that? Because... The greater the darkness, the greater the light. 
the more light shines. And so, encouragement for the believer, as discouraged as it can be living in times like this, and the frustration that mounts from the wickedness and the things that we hear on a daily basis and we see, we think, man, there's so much darkness. And like, I say, don't lose hope because the days are full of darkness. That's our time to shine for Christ in the midst of the darkness. Our time to shine. The question that we have to ask is, are we shining and will we continue to shine? And it goes back to that we got to get plugged in when we're not shining for Christ. So, with that said, I'm going to move on to the next subject material. We'll get it started here because we only have a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll pick this up next week. This is really important because we've been talking about the light. but we haven't been talking about is the source of light. Now, we know it's Christ, but in the candlestick, where did it get its light from? I mean, they had no electricity back then. They had, where, did, where did this thing burn? By the way, the Bible says that that candle was to never go out. That candle was representing something eternal. It was lit all the time. It, was never, it never went out. So where did, the, where did the candlestick get its light from? It says, bring the pure oil, olive, beaten, so olive oil, beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn. There it is. Always. So once again, we see the source of light was the Holy Spirit because the oil throughout Scripture, whoops, see if I can get that again. Throughout Scripture, oil is taught or, or foreshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do is we're going to study oil and, and what this all means through Scripture. And I'll give you one example here and then we'll, we'll close out. In Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 13, we, we see Samuel taking the oil, and the Bible says he anointed him, that is David, in the midst of his brethren, and this is what happened. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Now the difference in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, very important. This was a radical change. The Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not come to indwell believers. The Spirit would come on, come off. Come on, come off. It was a different ministry of the Old Testament. That's why Jesus was trying to teach His disciples. They didn't get it. He just said, wait for the promise. And the promise was, I'm going up, but my replacement, the Holy Spirit's coming down. And now He's going to live in you, and that's why Paul wrote, Christ in you. So here we see a foreshadowing of the Holy Spirit, this oil, anointing, what, which we're going to have to try to understand what that means, coming upon David. For what reason? So, the oil is connected to anointing, which is the sign of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to answer that question next week. But with this in mind, everything in the Old Testament, God used oil to anoint. Now, the priest and the tabernacle was anointed with not pure oil. It was anointed with oil and spices put together called the art of apocryphy, which is the art of perfuming. And they would take that and they, would, and they were to sanctify it using that oil and those spices, everything, as a picture of the Holy Spirit sanctifying it and placing His seal on it. And throughout the New Te or Old Testament, you see this anointing, this holy anointing. It comes from the word Christo, Christo, which is where the word Christ is from. Jesus is the, type, is the name of our Savior. Christ is His title. The word Christ is anointed one. So Jesus, Christ, Jesus, the name, Christ, the anointed one, Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the holy one, Jesus, the Messiah, which is the same word for Christ, though, Messiah. So you see that, and, and you can read from Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. So you'll see this consistency throughout Scripture about this oil and this anointing is a type of the Holy Spirit. And this, in summary, is where we get our power to live for Christ here on this earth. And that's what we're going to talk about because that's the source of power for the candlestick 
was the oil. So with that in mind, we'll prepare for next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the Holy Scriptures. Thank you for helping us and teaching us things from the, uh, the Scriptures about light and, Lord, how we are to draw closer to you that w- that light be manifested and your work may be done to glorify and honor you as you draw the world to you. And I pray that you'll help us, Lord, and in our walk, help us to walk in the Spirit and the power that you give us through the Spirit to glorify and honor you. Be with us in this hour of worship. May you guide and direct us with your Holy Spirit. Minister to us. Minister lifting up Christ that he may be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.